This lecture covers Chapter 1, Exploring Inner Space, an overview of what we'll be covering in the course. There was a time when science didn't study the mind, and in fact didn't believe that the mind could be studied. Scientists looked at stimuli and behavior. They studied rats and mazes and taught pigeons to play piano. And throughout all of it, never speculated on what was going on inside the black box of the mind. All of this changed in the 1950s with the birth of cognitive science. At one conference, Noam Chomsky presented some of his early work on linguistics. Newell and Simon presented work on their logic machine, a simulation of human problem solving. And George Miller talked about his magical number seven, plus or minus two. George Miller says, I date the moment of conception of cognitive science as 11th September 1956, the second day of a symposium organized by the Special Interest Group in Information Theory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. At the time, of course, no one realized that something special had happened, so no one thought that it needed a name. That came much later. In Stephen Pinker's blank slate, he notes five key ideas that made up the cognitive revolution. The mental world can be grounded in the physical world by the concepts of information, computation, and feedback. The mind cannot be a blank slate because blank slates don't do anything. And we'll come back to what this blank slate metaphor means very soon. An infinite range of behaviors can be generated by finite combinatorial programs in the mind. Universal mechanisms can underlie superficial variation across cultures. And finally, the mind is a complex system composed of many interacting parts. What is cognitive science? It is an interdisciplinary study of the mind with a focus on science. We use the scientific method as well as other methodologies to explore what the mind is and how it functions. It encompasses very diverse disciplines. Uh, originally, uh, philosophy, linguistics, psychology, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and anthropology were seen as the six participants. Nowadays, we also include emotion science, robotics, uh, a variety of uh, other disciplines, including evolutionary psychology. The key thing in studying the mind is that cooperation and communication between these disciplines makes it possible for us to take a comprehensive perspective on how the mind works. Two key concepts. Representation is something in the mental world or in the mind that stands for something else in the physical world. Computation are actions that are applied to mental representations and are the basis for thinking about them. There are several aspects of representation that are important for you to take note of. Representation can be realized in an informa information processing system like a person or a computer, and so it can be realized in a number of different places, in a number of different ways. Representational systems have content. A representation will have uh, content and stand for something specific, and that thing is known as a referent. Representations are grounded in our experience. A whole movement in cognitive psychology now, known as embodied cognition, is based on this observation. But a representation, because it can be realized in a number of different har hardware, varieties of hardware, um, can also be programmed, can be grounded through programming. Representations are interpreted either within the system itself 
or by some other system. Intentionality is also an important concept in this chapter. Representations are intentional. They are about something. In humans, this means that they have meaning. Another term for this is semantics. A representation is activated by its referent, the thing in the world that it refers to, or something that is related to that referent. Increasingly, we see that associated objects can prime the representation of a target object. In cognitive psychology, in fact, I can do I can point to a variety of pieces of research in which people will show you a word and it activates a related word and leads to a faster response to that word, a faster pronunciation of it, etc. And so these priming effects all depend on these associations between representations. You activate one representation and it activates associated rep representations. We'll talk more about this in the network chapter. Activation also produces referent related behavior. A famous study by John Barge several years back showed human subjects, college students, a variety of words in a in a word find that were related to elderly uh, and aging and when the participants left the room they walked more slowly than participants who had not been exposed to those words and so the activation of a representation can lead to not only other representations being activated but behaviors that are related when an input causes something in an output you call that an appropriate causal relation. Computation is the other key concept. Computation refers to operations or transformations that are performed on these representations. Mathematics gives pretty common examples. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and more advanced operations. But computation is much broader than this. And so when we're talking about computation and cognitive science, we're going to be thinking about how the senses compute and transform things into perceptions. How attention can move things from perception to memory. How language represents these things. And how we make use of all of these representations in our reasoning and problem solving. David Marr proposed the tri-level hypothesis. When we are approaching a problem in cognitive science, we need to approach it at three different levels. At the computational level, or the highest level, we need to specify the problem, and we also need to understand the function. At the alg algorithmic level, we specify the way that the problem is solved, a series of steps that you go through in order to accomplish the goal. And then at the implementational level, that's the point at which we specify the exact physical substrate or substance that allows the problem solving to occur. And so the computational level might specify the problem like how do we avoid predators. The algorithmic level might uh, specify a, a threat detection uh, protocol that happens whenever you see something approaching rapidly that looks like it's big enough to eat you. A series of things happens in the body. Adrenaline is released. You prepare to fight or flee. And when we start talking about these adrenal mechanisms, that's the implementational level. We're talking about the physical neurons that communicate the information to the endocrine system, which allows the secretion of these hormones that mobilize the body and allow it to effectively deal with the threat. There are a number of different views of representation. In the classical view of representation, which dominated early cognitive science, Symbols are the dominant player. 
Symbols are used to represent things, and computations involve the manipulation of those symbols. You can change symbols based on a set of rules, which can also be called syntax. Syntax is different from meaning or semantics. Meaning or semantics, these are what the representations refer to in the real world. Syntax is how you arrange these things and manipulate them. In the classical view of representation, knowledge is represented locally at one particular place in the system. So there'll be a node in the network that represents the symbol for attacking tiger. And when that becomes activated, it leads to a cascade of additional processes, perhaps actions to escape. But this processing all occurs in a serial order. We see an image. It's processed and understood to be a tiger. It leads to the release of adrenaline and an escape. Another more modern view of representation is the connectionist view. Connectionists, or neural network models of cognitive phenomena, include representations that are non-symbolic, or I prefer the term sub-symbolic. There are a number of different little neural processing units, and it's patterns across these units, patterns distributed throughout this system, that give rise to the representations. The representations could then be represented as symbols in a math problem, let's say, as we're working at a blackboard, but the neurons that are doing that operation are sub-symbolic. It's a collection of neurons that are giving rise to these symbolic uh, or seemingly symbolic processes. In contrast to the classical view, computation does not occur in serial, it occurs in parallel, which means that a lot of different neurons are processing things, simple things, in tandem at the same time. The classical view and many current artificial neural network approaches suggest that rep representations do not change. A new perspective, the dynamical systems approach, counters that these representations do change. Every time you see something like a car, your concept of the car changes. Computation may be cellular as well as multicellular. So neurons can compute, but multiple neurons working together can also lead to a process that we could call emergent because it can't be predicted from the individual components. And that emergent process could be a dynamical change of a concept, a transformation from one thing to another, or an accumulation of new information. The reason we adopt an interdisciplinary perspective is because every discipline that, com that contributes to cognitive science sees a different piece of the mind. Um, in the book, you'll read about the story of the three blind men. I won't reiterate it here, but essentially, uh, they all uh, feel a different aspect of the elephant and think that they're dealing with a different beast, and if they would talk together, then they would realize what the whole, the whole entity is, an elephant, instead of thinking that it is a sharp pointy thing like this poor gentleman is about to discover. In this book we'll talk about ten different approaches. The philosophical approach will be covered first and this is probably the oldest approach to what the mind is and how it works. The psychological approach arose when we started applying scientific principles and scientific approaches to philosophical questions. The cognitive approach arose in the 1950s and 1960s as an answer to some of the shortcomings of earlier psychological approaches. Neuroscience also arose at this time as we became more and more skilled at taking uh, a view of the, uh, of the mind as, as, as the brain that gives rise to it. The network approach also emerges out of this neuroscience approach, thinking about networks of individual processing units or entities working together 
to give rise to the computational complexity that underlies our behavior. Recently, the evolutionary approach has become very important. And so we'll talk about evolutionary psychology and how it explains the mind as something that has evolved and still carries a lot of vestiges of the Stone Age in which many of the cognitive processes evolved. The linguistic approach is another foundational aspect or foundational discipline for cognitive, the cognitive sciences. Language is a wonderful test case because it lends itself very easily to computation and, and simulation with computers. Uh, we'll see that there are very important issues that arose whenever we started thinking about how language is possible. In the initial formulation of cognitive science, emotions and social context were bracketed. They were left out of the, uh, of the equation. And that was necessary to focus on uh, processes of computation. But now it's become increasingly important to incorporate emotions and social cognition. And so we'll talk about both of those perspectives as well. Finally, artificial intelligence was a foundational discipline whenever cognitive science first began. It has continued to develop, um, often in ways that uh, diverge from some of the original intentions. Um, artificial intelligence is about using computers to mimic uh, the mind. And robotics uh, mimics not only th thinking but acting uh, the actions of, of thinking beings. And so both of these uh, will be dealt with toward the end of the course and uh, are some of the most exciting aspects of cognitive science today. It's worth making a note that there are different categories of representation. Um, and some of the ones that we'll keep seeing throughout the book include concepts. A uh, concept is a is a something that stands for a type of a type of thing. Uh, the word apple stands for all the different types of apples. So some apples are different colors, some apples are different sizes. But apple refers to the general idea. Uh, propositions are ways that we relate concepts to each other. They're statements about the world. So Mary's a concept. Black is a concept, hair is a concept, Mary has black hair is a statement that ascribes black hair as a property to Mary. Rules specify relationships between propositions. If it is raining, I will bring my umbrella as an example of a production rule. Finally, analogies allow us to make comparisons between things that are not as easily related as uh, one can do with formal rules and propositions. One can think that there are similarities between shoes and tires that make each one of them uh, share the property of wearing, um, wearing out. And so analogies metaphors and similes allow us to link new things together and often allow us to solve problems by relating a uh, new situation to a situation that we've encountered in the past.